Okay, in this video, we're going to explain why the Earth's interior is hot. Let's talk about heat and convection in the Earth. We have seen how seismology enables us to determine density, seismic velocity, and etc. as a function of depth in the Earth. Observation also tells us that the Earth is active, meaning we have volcanoes, earthquakes, mountain belts, and magnetic fields. This must be due to an internal heat or source. Earth has a hot interior. That's why we have volcanoes, hot springs, and mines at depth. Heat flows from center of the Earth to the surface via conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay, so let's discuss them one by one. Conduction is the process by which heat energy is transmitted through collisions between neighboring atoms or molecules. Take note that conduction occurs more readily in solids and liquids where the particles are closer together. In gases, not so much because the particles are further apart, okay? So we have this thing called thermal vibrations. So here, every atom is physically bonded to its neighbors in some way. So if heat energy is supplied to one part of a solid, the atoms vibrate faster. As they vibrate more, the bonds between atoms are shaken more. So this passes vibrations onto the next atom and so on. Take note that the rate of energy transfer by conduction is higher when there is a large temperature difference between the substances that are in contact. Next, we have convection. So convection happens when a fluid is heated and then travels away from the source. So this carries the thermal energy along. The fluid above a hot surface expands, becomes less dense, and rises. So basically, convection equals mass transfer. Okay. Also, remember that convection currents in the magma drive the plate tectonics. Next, we have radiation. Thermal radiation generates from the emission of electromagnetic waves. These waves carry the energy away from the emitting object. It is important to remember that radiation occurs through a vacuum or any transparent medium. So it's either solid or fluid. In simple words, radiation photon transfer. So now let's talk about the energy sources on Earth. So energy comes in many forms. And energy can be transformed from one source to another. So when dealing with sources of energy relating to Earth, we can differentiate between the types based on whether they are internal source or external source. So when we say internal source, this refers to the heat coming from within the Earth, such as Earth's internal heat and Earth's rotational and gravity field. I, what was that? Internal sources are responsible for volcanism, earthquakes, metamorphism, mountain building, and etc. So when we say external source, these are non-Earth generated, such as solar energy, gravitational energy from sun and moon. So the external sources tend to dominate surface processes, atmospheric processes, and biological activities. In this video, we're just going to focus on the sources of internal heat. We have primordial heat and radioactive heat. Primordial heat is the heat generated during Earth formation. And radioactive heat is the heat generated by long-term radioactive decay. Radioactive heat is generated by long-term radioactive decay. Okay, so let's talk about primordial heat. This is the internal heat energy accumulated by dissipation in planet during its few million years of evolution. Basically, they are heat released from collision of planetary objects during the early formation of planets. Okay, and these are the major sources of primordial heat. The first one is the accretion energy. It is the conversion of kinetic energy of smaller planetary objects into heat as they collided on accretion okay so the sequence will be collision the sequence will be collision seismic shock and then internal heating okay we have adiabatic compression so as something compresses heat is generated okay that is what we call adiabatic heating 
So take for example when you're pumping a bike. Okay, right? So when you pump, the bike expands. It's because heat is generated inside the pump. In simple words, it is heat generated as materials are compressed. As materials are compressed. Okay? So this is compression in which no heat is added to or subtracted from air. The internal energy of the air is increased by an amount equivalent to the external work done on the air. What is happening, bitch? The increase in temperature of the air during adiabatic compression tends to increase the pressure on account of the decrease in volume alone. Therefore, the pressure during adiabatic compression rises faster than the volume diminishes. Next, we have core formation heat. The heat from the Earth's core. Okay, so it looks like this. Here, the settling of iron converts the potential energy of iron to heat energy. Next, we have the decay of short-lived radioisotopes. So, in early solar system, we have isotopes such as aluminum-26, chlorine-36, and iron-60. They have half-lives of approximately 0.3 milliamperes. Okay. Take note of this because we have this thing called long-lived radioisotopes, okay? That's so upsetting. So next, let's go to the radioactive heat. So remember, all radioactive decay produces heat. However, only breakdown of isotopes with large half-life will have made a continuing contribution to heat source over geological time. There are four major radioisotopes that contribute to radioactive heat, or they are considered the long-lived radioactive isotopes. First is the thorium-232. Next, we have potassium-40, and then uranium-238, and uranium-235. Remember this four, okay? factor to consider is the geothermal gradient. It is the amount that the Earth's temperature increases with depth. This is a geothermal gradient. And as you can see, it is non-linear. This means that the increase in one variable is not proportional to the increase in the other variable. So in this case, depth versus temperature. So the temperature gradient in the crust is around 25 degrees Celsius per kilometer, okay? So the temperature gradient at the mantle is between 0 0.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer to 1 degree Celsius per kilometer, okay? The difference in temperatures drives the flow of geothermal energy, which humans use for electricity. So again, the geothermal gradient is non-linear. What happens if it is linear? Okay, so if temperature was linear, it should be expected that at depths below 100 kilometers, temperature could reach as much as 2,500 degrees Celsius. This would cause partial melting of rocks. And we know that Earth is essentially solid except for the outer core. Right? Most rocks beneath the surface is solid because the geotherm or geothermal gradient drops sharply a short distance into the earth. And that increasing confining pressure with depth counteracts the effects of increasing temperature. Based on the geotherm curve, it can be deduced that the mantle is considerably hot than the crust and the core is much hotter than the mantle. So you can see, this is the core mantle boundary, this is the outer core inner core boundary, and this is the Earth's center. Now, the question is, how is the Earth's internal heat distributed? So this figure shows the distribution of Earth's internal heat. As you can see, there is simultaneous conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay? So convection occurs at the mantle, but not between the core and the mantle, or even between the asthenosphere and lithosphere. Take note that the only heat transfer mechanism in these transition zones is through conduction. Okay.